Right. Somebody asked me, um, actually a couple minutes ago, I would come up with the, uh, the splice, you know, that word, that phrase. And it came out of um, uh, Sean Monroe's Litwire, who was, you know, the monthly calendar uh, that he does, litwire.org, where you can see all literary events. And um, and so we sat around and said, what are you doing? You're doing this lit wire thing? And so we thought, oh, wire, a wire. Oh, let's splice the wire. And so that's how we come with the splice. Factoid. <laughs> okay. okay. So we're extremely happy. We're uh, two and a half, 2.5 seasons now. I think. Oh, yeah. 1.5. <laughs> Feels like two. It feels One, like 2.5. Oh, okay. It's 1.5. <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself. That's okay. I'm looking at the <laughs> next volume. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Three. Yeah. Uh, okay. So so we have um, Bill Lavender. Who, everybody who lives in New Orleans knows exactly who Bill Lavender is. Much appreciated uh, member of our community. Um, and then Tyrone Williams, um, currently living in Buffalo, which will be, uh, he'll be introduced um, by Sean Monroe, and Bill Lavender will be introduced by Henry Goldcamp. So let's go. All right. Let's go. All right, indeed, let's go. The, the working title is Bill Lavender, a lover and a fighter. It's a lousy <laughs> title. St. Augustine of Hippo's most famous quote is this one. Faith is to believe what you do not see. The reward of this faith is to see what you believe. While overall it's a bit too Santa Clausy for my taste, I do think it's an effective commentary on the state of poetry a little bit delusional. We are as poets, but with good intentions. We go around and gather a group and try to prove that language can change the way we see the world, which is to say, change the world, perhaps even travel through time. No big deal. Bill Lavender's most recent project is an ekphrastic collaboration with a man 1,600 years his senior, the above, both in text and the heavens, St. Augustine, formerly known as Austin, pre-Jesus, pre sadly though, no relation to our time's famed wrestler, Stone Cold Steve Austin. <laughs> though I am about to promote the claim that they share many qualities, City of God, Augustine's famous work, was completed around the year 426 and was essentially a deus ex Rodeo Roundup of Rome's deities, weaponizing the polytheist rhetoric he was raised on as a child, launching flaming arrows of Christianity into all pockets of what gives life meaning. The full, less romantic title is Concerning the City of God Against Pagans. As one particular review from medieval times summarized its, shall we say, plot, quote, Righteous men were destroyed in this life, and the evil men flourished. In other words, an instant classic. <laughs> Stone Cold Steve Austin's famous work involved an altercation in 1996 after he had won a wrestling championship in his acceptance speech for the belt, which favored smack talk over grace. He tormented losing opponent Jake Roberts, who for lack of a better term, had a Christian shtick when it came to his wrestling. I quote Stone Cold here. You sit there and you thump your Bible and you say your prayers and it didn't get you anywhere. Talk about your Psalms, talk about John 316. Austin 316 says I just whipped your ass. <laughs> My point is as simple as Sesame Street. They're different. They're the same. <laughs> favorite book as a stray Catholic is The Golden Legend, a medieval text that registers many apocryphal but delightful biographies of the saints. St. Augustine tells of a time he came across a mysterious child injected by God with allegory. Because this is from a medieval text, I've taken the liberty of translating the original in order to understand what the devil they are saying. A little kid dug up a sand pit on a beach with a spoon, then proceeded to fill up the spoon in the ocean and try to fill up the pit with ocean water. Austin started screaming at him, what are you doing? The kid says he's going to transfer the entire ocean into the pit. Austin freaks out because <laughs> that's impossible. 
But then the kid turns it on him. The kid says, yes, forsooth, stupid. Then explains to Augustine about how it's a metaphor for trying to dump the mystery of the Trinity into his brain. Can't do it. <laughs> then the kid disappears. Or maybe not. Isn't that the problem with the nature of the image? Wild, untamed, it comes and goes as it pleases a dinghy with one sheet to the zeitgeist. Maybe the kid walks into a field of lavender and huffs it. I can't help but also perhaps see Bill Lavender running back and forth with his spoon between the sea and the pit. There he is, inheriting the earth. There he is, riding at the confluence of the Mississippi and Tiber Rivers from the, quote, city we create in our fury, a place to be exiled, a mirror from his collection, Surrealismo. Quote, Faith is to believe what you do not see. The reward of this faith is what you believe, said St. Austin, which is not only a testament of his Christian ethos, it's also a Greek rhetorical device known as antimetaboly. The word antimetaboly derives from the Greek suffix anti, meaning against, of course, and the Greek root metaboly. Meta right? Yeah? Nobody's complaining. Meaning change. <laughs> against change. At the moment, I cannot think of a more unpoetic apolitical act. Dean Millman, the 19th century historian, says of St. August, August, <laughs> Augustine's City of God, quote, the Babylon of the West had passed away. In its place had arisen the City of God, the Church of Christ. A new social system had emerged from the ashes of the old. That system was founded by God, was ruled by divine laws, and had the divine promise of perpetuity. I am not one to spat with 19th century historians, but underhandedly likening Augustine's text to the myth of the phoenix and its analogs indeed glimmers the palimpsest of pagan syncretism so richly embedded in Christian ethos. But Bill Lavender, after reading nearly all of his oeuvre in the past month, is a poet of the people. And those big mysteries, a la the Holy Trinity et al., sometimes can be mirrored in those poets of the people, no? Ground such heavenly concepts, here again is Stone Cold Steve Austin speaking on his first major breakthrough deal in 1995 as a professional wrestler. I get a chance to speak what's on my mind and from my heart, and I find that is where the best promos come from. The ones that come from your gut and your heart. Then he pauses for a second. And from your brain, because you've got to feel them. Words don't mean anything if you don't mean them. For some, that might register as a nastily redundant pleonism. For others, the truth. I venture to guess that most poets, including Lavender, fall under the camp that language is a thing ruled by many gods. The city of God can at once be decamped and resurrected by poetry. The city of poets can take its place and is its place at the same moment. The ethical binary of the poet and the relationship to image, the liminality of what is both real and unreal, Lavender posts up on the ropes early as the second of City of God, also the title of his work, in the poem's substantial sequence. How invoke a God who does not exist? How invoke one who does? It's only fair we finish with a tap out of the hypotext for us in 316. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Surely you can picture Augustine, FKA Austin, shouting from the center of his ring, situated right in the middle of town. And as the pyrotechnics pop off and the air horns announce the incoming contender, the crowd as wild as the image, here is Bill Lavender, ready to get in the ring, quote, to gaze at eternity is always to look backward. I'm in with my pitchfork, my cardboard sign. I don't want the avant-garde, those forward thinkers, to go down without a fight. Like it or not, we all have to contend with the shapes that were put in by the higher-ups, the deities, God, corporate billionaires, or otherwise. Even before Augustine's time, there were bread and circuses, then popcorn and movies, and then a latte and a Twitter feed. Rome ain't burning yet, but I know just the poet for the job. He's a carpenter just like Jesus, and he's got a pack of matches in his pocket and maybe even a little rock and roll here to build this city, this ring ring, Bill Lavender. I did.
request that Henry introduce me. <laughs> but I confess it exceeded all, all expectations. The wrestling metaphor was not one I anticipated. <laughs> So I'm um, lost now in the dim fog of my 70-year-old memory is why I ever decided to do this project. But for some reason, about five years ago, the idea occurred to me to do a project that was reading through City of God. I don't know why, I'd only read a little bit of Augustine, like most of us have, uh, excerpts from the Confessions, which are like really pretty, and uh, um, you know, you can see from them how Bob Dylan could write his song about a dream I saw St. Augustine, and it's like this kind of sad, beautiful thing. Um, and so I was kind of gearing up for it. I'd also read, you know, it's like one of the seminal texts of uh, Western philosophy. And I thought, okay, I'll read it, you know. I'm, uh, I'm over 70 now, you know, I should be concerned with the city of God, right? So go, you know, go, um, so, uh, so, I, so I started the project, and it just, this, this is like the freakiest thing, okay, is that I started it, I picked up the translation I decided to use and started reading it on January 6, 2021. <laughs> And uh, which you might recall is the day of the, the election certification day when uh, the Trump uh, people stormed the uh, White House. And Jordan Park. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and so I was literally sitting on the couch reading it, and Nance said, "I want to look at this. Let me see what's going on here." And uh, so I kind of start looking at the TV and see it. And what, at the moment in the text, what Augustine is talking about is the sacking of Rome. And um, he's talking about painted barbarians storming the walls. And, um, and I'm looking at this. And, uh, and so that's where the whole nutty idea began. And I mean, it never occurred to me that it would become a four-year process. My plan now is to end it on Inauguration Day in 2020. When's it going to be? 25. 25. Um, I'm approximately 300 poems into it. Um, and so uh, I, I have to set a limit. It'll take me about that long. It's been a, it's been a hard road because let me tell you, it's uh, the prose is not captivating. Um, and I'm trying to think, I could talk the entire time just introducing it, unfortunately. But um, just want to say a couple of things, like one of the things that, um, a few surprises that I encountered very early on, one is that Augustine, despite his uh, saintly reputation and um, his seminal position in uh, the Catholic Church, is a polytheist. Um, he argues with the pagans and at in all sorts of levels, but um, he never says that anything they say is false, okay? The pagan gods are profligate. They have sex with humans. They have incest uh, in their own families. They, you know, fuck each other's wives and husbands. Um, 
but he never indicates that they don't exist or anything like that. He takes everything he reads is scripture. I mean, scripture just means writing, right? And so everything he reads, he takes as what we would call fact. It took me a long time to get used to that. Um, and um, what else did I want to mention? So the book starts, is, Steve God starts out by talking about the sacking of Rome. Rome was sacked in 410 by a guy named Alaric, who was um, a Visigoth warrior. He had actually been a Roman general, because Rome had this habit of, when they conquered someone, they would then conscript their armies uh, to fight for them. But Alaric, they fucked him over some kind of way, and he got mad, and so he went and sacked Rome. And you might be thinking that um, the sacking of Rome meant that Rome lost something. But actually, Alaric and the Visigoths had no interest whatsoever in maintaining an empire or even governing a city. They just went in and they literally sacked it, raped, pillaged, took all the jewels, and left. And, uh, and that was it. It was pretty much a one-day affair. Um, I just wanted to mention Alaric because I talk about him a bit. So like the way I proceed is, Alaric reminds me of Prigozhin, for one thing. I mean, when Prigozhin turned around and headed toward Moscow, I thought, wow, that's like, yeah, you know, it's a real parallel. So there's a lot of uh, stuff like that in here. And who does Augustine remind me of? Eh, probably Trump. Yeah. <laughs> um, There are a billion other things I need to say, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to start. I'm going to read the first poem that I wrote on January 6th, and I'm going to close with the last poem to date that I wrote this morning. Um, I think I'm just going to read straight through them. They don't have titles or anything. I might start reading their little segment numbers just to draw a line between them. Um, 1621. City of romance, city of law, city of fable, city of souls, ruled solely by the lust to rule. Earthly dignities totter on this shifting scene. I should say there are a lot of little short quotations. I think I'm just going to do that. Let's see if that works. Earthly dignities totter on the shifting scene. Bacchae along the trellis, goths in the garden, painted barbarians, bull helmet, fawn skin, boots on marble, hooves on broken glass. We speak of an earthly and of the other city and of the enemies of both unable to utter a single word to its prejudice. City of granite, city of vapor, walls raised up in the smoke of war, shrine at the gate. We persist in an image we assemble as the castaway lashes debris onto a raft and then climbs aboard. How invoke a god who does not exist? How invoke one who does? A history of raised banners pauses for a moment of rhetorical silence. Guardian gods flicker on the nightstand. Product accumulates as wet hoarders assemble evidence for the Q conspiracy. Senators, this is another parallel where we get the word senator from Rome. Senators huddle in the stairwells, clutching torn scrolls. Theologians roam the halls, 
horror film suspense, thumb cocking the pistol. Perhaps reporters transcribe what did not happen or what the truth extorted from them. For what does an enemy do when sacking a city? Though to be sacked is not to fall, as Alaric recalls. Virgins and boys were violated, Augustine says. Temples and great houses plundered. Slaughter and burning corpses, blood and wailing, and not from foreign foes, but from citizens inside. The vice president, Principe Senatus, cut off from above, huddles with his family beneath a table, lips moving silently through the litany of jingos handed down to them as prayer while rams batter the door and voices shout the most worldly admonitions. They're in here. Bring a hammer. Give me that crowbar. Slaughter, plunder, burning, and misery. These are the custom, the novel thing, that savages show themselves so fine, or so says St. Augustine. It was the Council of Rome that set precedent for the current president and the ecclesiastical debate on the ethics and expedience of torture. Here in the moment, a beggar at the stoplight gives a big thumbs up. Have a great day, he yells through my sealed window, moves to the next car. Donors receive no special treatment and they wheel away, swearing off Caritas yet again as he mutters assholes under his breath. <laughs> I forgot to mention that I throw in like everyday life all the way with impunity. This mortality business is in fact ill-omened, at least for those of us who can't afford Buddhism. But the purple requiem set assures us for the laid out for sky burial or potluck on a forgotten battlefield, your meat matters not. For matter, complete with surname and picture ID, shall be restored, bodies formed anew. And no doubt new recruits headed for that new world of democracy chained in the hold passing over the highway of bones took consolation that the god of their slavers stood by Jonah in the belly of the beast and walked with the trio in the furnace without even singeing his turban and besides history recounts, recounts many who when washed overboard were received on a dolphin's back and carried to land and surely he provides similar succor for those thrown over the side, still in their chains. The sanctity of the body, Augustine proposes, does not reside in the integrity of the components, as there can, of course, be accidents. One might, for example, destroy a maiden's virginity while merely attempting to ascertain it. For the city is founded upon a woman's body, the sacking and the sacrament upon a woman's body, the scaffold rope and pulley upon a woman's body, Lucretia's double homicide upon a woman's body. Lucretia, uh, mythical or historical, who knows, Roman figure uh, who was raped by a conqueror. Yeah, she was in the royal family, I think. She was raped and uh, committed suicide from shame. Augustine talks a long time about whether it was ethical for her to commit suicide. <laughs> Be alert, maiden, for when the body is subjected to the enemy's lust, an insidious pleasure 
might entice your soul to consent. Yet, even in this case of a rapist's fantasy come true, suicide is proscribed and Lucretia damned. For lust follows its own law and mortal members remain blameless as the man who awakens erect. <clears throat> One of many things that Augustine is fascinated with is the phallus. He talks about it over and over. The one interesting thing I learned that word member, if you look up the etymology of it, it uh, <clears throat> from the Proto Indo, -Indo European root, it meant sex organs, uh, either male or female, and um, acquired its meaning as like a member of an organization or a member of a church as kind of metaphorical assumption from the church as the body of Christ. So the member is Christ's dick. <laughs> Just think about all your memberships. <laughs> Bless me, Father, for I confess to disappointment that no alleviation of the hobbling, wobbling, doddering, and moldering mental and physical states appears to be in the cards even for righteous little me on the way to the rising up again within my brand new, again, clothed in light, mystical body. But, mortal enemies one day, piles of dust the next, throwing the churches, then home to TV, and this is all you know in life, here in the earthly and in that other city. If this is purification, what exactly would pollution look like? The concubine mother of your son dumped in the gutter so you could marry a rich tween. These are real things from Augustine's biography. How could any god worthy of the name let all this happen? If it were a movie, would you talk about it in front of your mother? Or Augustine, before he took the vows, had a concubine that is uh, uh, mother gave him as a gift, sort of. Sorry, so much to say. Augustine was born a Berber, okay, in northern Africa, in what's now Algeria. He was a Berber. The Berbers have inhabited North Africa since prehistory, long before biblical times. Um, when Rome took them over, uh, certain of the Berbers sort of assimilated into Roman society. This was Augustine's family. His um, parents forbade him to learn the Berber language. Uh, they only spoke Latin in the house. Latin was the only language that was uh, permitted and uh, basically never ever spoke of or uh, embraced his Berber blood, let's say, as anything but an embarrassment, which is why I refer to him sometimes as a proto-Oreo. <laughs> now, if the goddess mother were to know your soul, know what you do, what you think in the wee hours, wouldn't friends and family blush for you? Unless, with the flip of a switch, she become an adulteress to entangle you in her deceit, causing you to lust, or just, what you justly loathe. Try to be temperate as Scipio, so that the Senate lays in your hands this image of the double woman, which you may convey one day into the capital. 
the rhetoric proves with impeccable logic that the gods which do not exist could give a shit about the city and let people party at Mardi Gras even as floodwaters rise. <laughs> Once again, secret messages whispered in my ear, or is that just the mushrooms? <laughs> but here they come, like every Mardi Gras, lugging their crosses by the gay bars, and the boys and chaps offer up their asses. Pardon the Pasquinade. Pasquinade is a parody. Um, that's the word the translator used. Pardon the Pasquinade. But was there ever such an unblemished rep more deserving to be taken down? You praise Cicero advocating death for satirists, even as you satirize. But the longevity of your name will depend entirely on haloed accounts. Your son you barely knew, and your concubine, his mother, whose name you will never utter, sent back to Africa vowing chastely to never know another man while you lounge in Beata Vita, the beautiful life, with the boys in Milano. Why am I wasting my time on you? Your moralism and hypocrisy are everything I despise, like my father, perhaps, who sent my mother packing to the dark corners of her mind while I walked through the valley of the shadow and turning to him, receive slaps and homilies, hand-me-downs, all the way from you. It's a little tough, quite frankly, to pasquinade it away sometimes, but like a banger, I wear your death sentence with pride. Politicians and porn stars mind the rights as ithyphallic actors mount the stage, a phase that will morph into church. Labeo held evil gods should be worshipped evilly with blood sacrifice, good ones with potluck, milk, and cookies left on the table, for example. So for whom are these whips and bondage in a cheap motel? Syllogism. Gods prove themselves non existent by licentious behavior. The universe consumes itself with a pop. He sits at his table writing, writing all day. When I bring ink or bread and olives, he hands me a missile and gives the command without looking up. I see myself through his eyes, a heap of dirty clothing, something vague inside. From palace to church to palace I go, from body to soul and back, carrying the scroll. Like a city in which the power is gone out, vague silhouettes, gray on gray, the maneuvering of furniture, shadowy successes and submissive slaves, deep well from which the first rumblings of orgasm come. Imagine the dreams of the Berber who spoke no Berber, for Latin was all the earthly father allowed. His argument for the superiority of Christ over the pagan deities, he borrows from Cicero's for the superiority of Latin over Greek, which, in fact, he never troubled to learn. So what might the slave nanny, her native language forbidden, have called the boy genius's little messes? Urination, defecation? Today's Catholicism might have had a different catechism had Augustine had words like pee-pee and poo-poo and screw. Perhaps his penis wouldn't have been so disgusting if it had been his winky. And perhaps if he had been able to call the concubine's vagina a kitty, he could have also named the woman herself. And maybe then 
he wouldn't have despised himself for loving her. Like Hitler and Trump, Augustine worries that his enemies might corrupt the people's votes. The human bed, tousled, cum stained, where Sylvia got it on with Mars and founded Rome. Unless, of course, a sly bitch made it all up to save her best alas from being buried alive. I'm not coming down one way or another on the debate, just saying it's a possibility. For as we all know, a god likes to get a little now and then. It happens all the time about Mari Nostrum. So the penalty for Vestal Virgins uh, slipping uh, is, was to be buried alive. And uh, Mari Nostrum, if you don't know, is the old name for the Mediterranean. And so, a dense crowd of gods descended on the capital. Gods, male and female, foreign and local, analog and digital, with briefcases full of cash and tablets full of laws. And the gods partied down, inviting the senators to orgies in expensive hotels, snorting coke off the bosom of the goddess, thanks to a bottomless well of corporate cash. We were having a ball, but it was too good to last. No earthly heaven lasts. Civil wars and servile enacted in the city code and archived in the child's kleptomania. Pithy sayings and epic narratives join the liar's pact to create consciousness as advertised. Life, modern and otherwise, bitter for this toothless hag. I have a bunch of false teeth. And now I'm going to have an intermission. Um, I have a section in the middle of the book that's devoted to a couple of little ancillary things. One is that when I got this far along in the project, I was uh, distressed by its magnitude, and I started looking around for someone to help me. And um, one thing that someone could have done for me would be the annotation, because there are about 4,000 footnotes going to be required. And uh, <clears throat> so I, um, I knew this uh, person who was grad student in uh, at Roger Williams who had interned with me doing some manuscript uh, proofing. And she happened to email me and say, you know, I'm really looking out of school now, I'm really looking for some kind of editorial work to do, I won't charge much, you know. And I said, okay. And I just um, turned around and sent her the manuscript and said, um, can you see what you think about this? Do you think you can annotate it for me? And I didn't hear from her for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, um, and then I got this email. <laughs> Dear Mr. Lavender, here's my update, RE City of God. Thank you for your patience. First of all, thank you for trusting me with this assignment. Respectfully, my conscience won't allow me to undertake it, because within your very interesting writing style, you seem to be reflecting that January 6th was an insurrection, and also that Pres Trump instigated it. I strongly disagree with this idea. I try to get as close as possible to truths and facts by not simply accepting the current government's pronouncements, as if that's what I'm doing. And instead, by researching those 
and other sides to the story through the best, well-sourced, and responsible writings I can find. I feel like I am then protecting the freedom of my own mind, as well as defending America's hard-won freedoms in a way that brings some real clarity to a lot of fog. If you're interested in pursuing that kind of fog clearing, <laughs> here are some suggestions, and there are many others. <laughs> Review articles at revolver.news, at the National Pulse, at the Gateway Pundit, American Mind, humanevents.com. These are all like, you know, evangelical right wing uh, sites, you know, the, the Tucker Carlson kind of thing. Again, thank you for the opportunities you have given me, and very best wishes to you. Sincerely, should I tell you her name? I'm going to. <laughs> so I told you, and Augustine has this kind of focus on the phallus, which I'm I'm basically uh, skipping over, but it um, started kind of affecting me after a while. <laughs> <laughs> Dear St. Augustine, what do I do with this? <laughs> Last night, I dreamed my dick was huge like levers, hard as rocks standing above me like a totem. I'm fascinated with its touch and cannot leave it alone, but just as I'm about to come, someone walks in the room and I try to cover it up. I can't, of course. All I can do is hug it to my breast, and she pretends not to notice as I furiously blush. Okay, that's all for the intermission. <laughs> Read a little section um, of there are a hundred themes that I that sort of go through these poems and um, these this is a selection of that were written kind of around uh, the Ukraine war. It is a great question among men whether man can be mortal and blessed, end quote. And perhaps the ladies too ask this question as they board the last trains out of Kiev, leaving their men behind to intercede with Putin's tanks, and Zaporizhia has fallen while the in-game hackers have darkened a few screens. The queue of souls upbound from the fields is approaching the interminable. The city of God is to the city of man, Augustine, the master of analogy, points out, as the Kharkiv of a week ago is to Kharkiv this morning. Perfect apartments and avenues versus piles of smoking rubble, commuters who rode the subways versus living there. And since neither Biden nor Macron proved up to the task of mediation, it falls to Christ to intercede and welcome the flood of refugees across the border to their new life of eternal bliss. The gods, if so minded, might mingle with men so as to see and be seen, hear and be heard. Is that what the clamor's about? Egos like college professors demanding laurels consummate with their rank? Or do they walk, do they come like Whitman's Jesus and walk pallid with the wounded to the border? Like Theodosius, Putin has no recollection of promising anyone anything and shells the humanitarian corridor. Tip for that, McDonald's and Starbucks shut down Moscow operations, the rubles taking a nosedive anyway. Fingers crossed the resulting hardship causes the tyrant to think twice. <laughs> oh, 
aerial demons set between the ethereal gods and earthly men, strafing apartment blocks and reactors, bombing the mo this morning in Mariupol, a maternity hospital, as we lift off from this earthly plane, please intercede for us with whoever's on duty from here in humanity's gutter. Hear our plea. Resembling the demons in pride, but not in knowledge. Or have we entered a new phase? Demon, daemon, power knowledge, heat guided like the missile. Gas prices soaring in California prompt an outpouring of caritas for kindergartners positioned under the bombs. The Saint Javelin emoji goes viral, raising a million plus. Zelensky, sexiest man alive. TikTok feed is off the charts with swooning women. And at the Polish border, Mother Courage still searches for her children. Two more. Certain men shall be caught up to meet Christ in the air. Oh, it's quite the roller coaster ride, this spirituality business. Scary. Hold up your hands at the top for the most exquisite vertigo. Whacked. But can't be any dumber than faithing one's fellow mortals, clawing and clawing for community. And this one from this morning, if you saw the paper. Today, the local archdiocese launches its GoFundMe to pay legal fees and restitution to those few, well, 500 or so, little sinners, Hannon successors and assigns, diddled in the course of shepherding their flocks. So drop an extra dollar in the plate this Sunday so the good works may continue. And remember, as Augustine said above, as long as they didn't actually get into it, the youngsters should be okay in heaven's tally and join the priests themselves in the blessed city when the travails of this life have mercifully passed. Thanks for uh, sitting through that. Thank you. Keep it going for Bill Lavender. Next up, we have Tyron Williams, who is the David Gray Chair of Poetry and Letters at SUNY Buffalo, which is to say he takes poetry, poetics, and its practice seriously. He is the author of several chapbooks and seven books of poetry, and the type of variation in aesthetics and projects in one's publishing life can be seen as risky in our industrialized poetry publishing scene. But his books are a testament to what the reward is for that risk. Here's a rundown. In 2002, Krupskaya published his first book, CC, where his aesthetics spiral from colloquial street vernacular to a comprehensive array of theoretical concepts. In 2008, Omnidon published On Spec, where he tussles with how meaning conveyed by a word, much like a subject influenced by external factors, is constantly in flux adjusting to the demands and disguises of its context. In 2009, the Backwater Press published The Hero Project of the Century, where he goes after the perpetual unattainability of emotion and intellect in the self. In 2011, Dos Madres Press published Adventures of Pi, where he acclimatizes a comprehension of the symbols in our corporate urban landscapes. Also in 2011, Atelios Books published Howell, where he writes through the history of Howell, Michigan, unafraid of engaging and transmuting a place history and its context. In 2017, Hostel Books published a limited edition art project, Trump Lay, 
which say 52 crushed tissue boxes containing epithets directed at that president-elect. <laughs> In 2018, Omnidon published As Is, where he contemplates the duality and multiplicity between Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. In 2019, Tyrone and John Huvin edited an anthology of critical essays inciting poetics, where, from University of New Mexico Press, the anthology illuminates the contemporary frameworks that govern the existence of poetry. Its goal is to excite and incite poetics, and it does. Highly recommended read right there. In 2021, Delete Press published Wash Park, a collaboration with Pat Clifford, where they challenged civic domains and Western notions of progress. In 2022, Wayne State University Press published Stilettos in a Rifle Range, where he pillories the material sass and verb of relationship linguistics. And here we are in 2023. Tonight, I urge you to listen deeper than meter and scheme because these poems build phonemes into melodies and the syntax organizes into chord progressions that harmonize a fragmented parataxis. In these poems, you'll oscillate between aesthetic and anti-aesthetic choices as a means of poesis. Ultimately, a rowdy socio-spatial dialectic resonates in the dead serious absurdities and re-slanged and unslanged cliches that frazzle our frantic socio-political nows. To put it in New Orleanian terms, some of the poems are like listening to Soul Rebels Brass Band interpolate a medley of three songs to antagonize the mayor about wasting taxpayer monies when she walks into a bar. But the lens in these poems is wider. This isn't a vicious poetics enacted on a vicious world. This is the pressure of the people's language percolated into a descent serum. There is one constant through the course of Tyrone's work, a dedication and discipline to the practice of poetry. There is the struggle and pressure of form and content grinding against each other, sometimes lovingly, sometimes viciously, sometimes hilariously, but always a tense dialectic. In this, there is no solution, no answer to the big question which doesn't exist. There is the work and the ride. Each of you has a ticket tonight for that ride, and I'm thankful you're here for it. Please welcome to the Splice stage, Tyrone Williams. I'm not as tall as Bill. <laughs> Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Rodrigo, for inviting me down. So I'm going to be reading from three projects, um, basically three poems. And the first. I'll start with this one because I was talking with uh, Matt earlier about music and um, this poem is a kind of compressed history of um, not just American popular music but also what that music meant to um, a certain generation and I have to tell you that because you might not pick that up after you hear this poem. Anyway, it's called Vocals by Radio waves a kissogram, ear smack against the mouth, pure syntax cut adulterated grammar, thumb and finger turning station after station into pillow talk run ins, eyes trained on orbital lipstick. The Kit Carson Kabuto booted. Bass Reeves, the Empress of the Blues, passed on the Queen of the Blues, the King of Western Swing, back on the, t on the ranch, the Queen of Soul, cross-eyed church. A medley of adult chords, tikka masala grips, 
barrel house mercury, four or five hiccups above top of the charts. The Grand Ole Opry's Holleresque Yolo. Otis wrote it, or put his name on it, or in it, in parentheses, below Aretha Franklin, took it back as if she'd owned it long before he had written it, or put his two cents in lieu of pickpocketed eyes. If a cane drags behind, as the future of a pair of legs, then is the middle name of Gemini. If a hook drags the Apollo off stage at the Bluebird Cafe, jeers are one size fits all jerseys. To have listened to the messenger hawked on street corners, watched the photograph of Kenyan X, German, then German-American von Braun. Hear the pimp rise amp up the body to a bass-beaten ear. The grand old party slides with A and B, not A-A-B. Should have said, well, never mind. <laughs> I was gonna. I have a friend who makes <clears throat> fun of me because I'm always talking about form. So anyway, I'm not gonna talk about it. But these, uh, but with this, I am. <laughs> so that was a mix of uh, a Villanelle and Sestina. That's all. That's okay. So. Just yeah. <laughs> 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 think about some earlier comments. Um, this is prepared tankas. So, and uh, <clears throat> specific subject here again, because you might not pick this up listening to it, um, is the um, 1989 incident with Charles Stewart, a lawyer from Boston, who killed his wife um, and then blamed it on an unknown black man. That was 1989. Um, and the police went searching for this mysterious uh, person who, of course, did not exist. A few years later, Susan Smith in, North Car in South Carolina um, drove a car to the edge of a boat ramp, uh, got out, and then let the car go into the lake, killing her two sons. And she, too, then blamed that on a mysterious black man. So this poem is a bringing together of those two incidents. And in the middle of this, as you'll see here, there's a reference to 1990s rap, or rappers, I should say. Prepare tankas. And I quote from some of the um, interviews with Charles Stewart as well as some other stuff in this poem. Oh, I'm driving with the lights off. She sat and sang for hope that is no fame. Her songs died on air. I'm on death's support, besieged by 17 days. We're here again, sentence me to have life, are the children done yet? Can't look back at hobos, so don't fence roses for the flush of Christopher like a fiend hid in a cloud of ocean, which severed his soul's swoon 
O-M-H-O, driving with, equals vacay speed, lame streams, upcoming season, dizzy over conquer, will be waiting, Tobin will be waiting, I'm bound to cross. Mystic in black face with black hole, in open the oven door and check, one in two is too painful to pluck an ivy branch for me. Good night, my love, sweet wife. God has called you to his hands. Set two and ten, but still that gangster lean into your passenger seat. Matthew, nine iron, jewelry, Gucci bag. He heard the snow falling faintly on Mission Hill. <clears throat> Niggas, so, so centrist, add a motherfucker so you ignorant near niggers hear me. My Adidas walk through concert doors, roam all over Coliseum floors. I'm at the top of the top. I climb out of water, time, days later, with a Sorry, with a knot down or baseball cap, Alex and Michael in my arms as I wade ashore, a wedding dress, billows at the end of a boat ramp with the back of a fork, or gondola sans gondolier. But one remembers yet with my hands over my ears drifting into the arms of trouble. Trouble holds me behind <clears throat> the grate. I have him trifled at the gate, run through woods and strain my face for cameras going supernova into close-ups, sun's new earth. This is Ab Abbasidarian. Um, it's too complicated to talk about. <laughs> skip that. Um, I don't know what to say about this. <laughs> it is what it is. A. Lo, fidelity emerges from a noise, pounding the shore, her sails belied by a low drum, propellers, and so those hoisted veils lift and lit the eye, while lower boats go unseen, the steady splash of oars unheard. The infidel extends a hand, sticks out a tongue, sniffs, no, and joins his brethren underwater. B, gymnasium, long in the tooth, shrinks. Jim goes one-on-one -on -one against the health club, AKA athletic center. Up and down the court they go, a tower enjoins, Napoleon cliche, trading layups and trays until a monster dunk sends old knee highs flying to the brink of irrelevance. Brushing off the glitter of shattered glass, red converses step up to the free throw line, sinks one, rims the other, clock runs down, stop. C. Hubris of the A game brought up from triple A, ergo, I, M. So kudos to the lounge, lounge lizard, his ship in, her big score, old saws for green apples. 
There's always a wizard, god, or bridge loan hauling someone's ass out of family court. Above each alt and overpass, a vehicle lights out, hurdles through a darkness bright as blood. Twice told, taught, the invention of sirens for wax in the ears. D. Jew the verb was Greek to me. Little league and Latin club notwithstanding, the grown up who never learned to love or leave it sans declension. Caught colds, the flu, never a Jew by the toe. Sought refuge under cover, but my skin, the leak. The fire next time, some time ago. Waterboarding soon to come. The ark, a dream under construction, while animals learn to speak. Kill two blacks with one Jew. Mm. E. K and J pop, but not the pop pop of indigo girls. Ellison's blues, right left to our own devices, is a free app in a black box. Flatline data, error messages. They take the rap and so do we. But everybody gets a pass to tap that asset. Drop futures and give us 40, adjusted for streaming screams. All in to front the kids. Adolescent perp, tween cop, toe the hill, a cap in your hat. Liability studies started by a coalition of unused gesso, dried out brushes, cutting room celluloid, crossed out words, deleted emails, Negro conservatives, plastic bottles, curds, mimeo sheets, Pluto the planet, Xerox and Xerox, landlines, newspapers, convicted policemen, unmarried uncles, fur wraps, cassette decks, USSR, styrofoam, dead wood, any president, premier, black leather pants, burning leaves. In middle management, Stop, sorry, start over. Middle management, stop gap angels trolling for the man, pouring over cloud recordings of his TED talks. <laughs> Rumor has it he's been hoarding anti government sanitizers, but no, he's clean, his mud flaps absorbing blowback. Still, his crew is moving him to a safe universe. They check the booby traps, turn out the lights, and hear hope spring. Trip. Our Occidental periods spin a table into a tableau of judges holding tins above their heads. A show of hands that runs until the sunset of sunsets. Never sets as it gradually slows down to the crawl of a minuet. Some minarets first call. S. The tremor of pursed lips belies pure ventriloquism. Be heard, not seen. A purse is big wallet, small cash, except when it's not. Prize money too large to call, stuffed wallet. Dialed and dog animus pair up under threat, small fry, frying pan, and fire. Only one speaks, only one mouth moves. We can't read her, their, I talk, but for the fortunate mute. T, queerdom came as hands were dealt, 
For example, four of a kind trumps two pairs of two colors, number or face. They can't take selfies, can't be simply tell to ask. Rubik cubes and slant tropes, puns and homonyms. Pie disfigures telltale couples, shorts triangles, even as mores pursue more. C, D, E, J, K, M, etc. Held in reserve. New blues to the Greeks for a spell. Tom Tomboy foolery. U, S, T, R, E, S, S. Undercover syllables, syllabachi sentences, snake their way through crawl lapses, sorry, through crawl spaces of the big house. The third policeman and last imam, hidden behind Wall Street, second coming, cast misspells, Scotus potus, in beats they cannot walk, stilted side to side shuffling, geometric right angle hypot hypotenuse, dyslexia, girth angel hype, tenuous will you be, minds the underbellies of chalk outliers. V. Tattle tails can't keep their traps shut. Jaw jabbering to anyone within earshot, eye to batting eyes. I too was taken in by the lyric. Coy smiles, mere wiles, to make me sing, read out my VPN of strokes and tropes. Hacked account, business all in the street, nothing but naked poetry, a wild leer, and a hand placed discreetly between the lines of a panegyric. All that's left for me, cut bait both ways. Catch me if I can't. W. Upstream against the rapids, overturned kayak, oars, toothpicks, strike a match, tallow candle with glass hoodie, or text Uber, the new yellow LED. Can you send a signal from Utah, from Utah? But folk, oops, sorry, I blew that one. <laughs> Life coach, post jacket, taking on water while treading water, and yet become, become, become becomes an underwhelmed down another fistful of asses. if we're not back at work on Monday. X, ventriloquism of the hand, let fingers do the walking through these yellow legal paths. Vocals by machine in the ghost haunts the body, that madcap accumulation, primitive and late. A strange land, I only simulate escape Lift one foot as if to step into orbit. Fail safe the other. I cannot stand to raise a country I carry about. Why? Why indeed? Winter weekdays, ends, intergenerational cold shovel into a mouth without a tongue. Belated better not to be cold comfort. A little heat from wannabe diamonds. Some weather from a pen pal, radio waves, books, sufficient today. Innocent of legal tender until driven out of bedroom and basement. Washed down, scorched, clean of magic. Smith Corona Defender disabled. Open source bandage. Click on speak. Z, x-rays and xeroxes make one case for history. 
always on trial for treason. Invisible slice of hand unfelt, self-slapped heads, X unknown, X, 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 known unknown. Spontaneous welts sprout from limbs, torsos, e pluribus histories, plu histories, even as moons chase, chase parentage back to Unum, an ur illuminated cave, or Ulipo game. X in Y axis, back and base of upper case, incomplete, E, finish L. Zero. Yes closes a book. Yes, 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 books a room at the funny farm. Yonder then a stereo yawn spanned by draw suspension bridges. Wagers made, wages withdrawn. Yo-yo bungee jumping over the sides. You might say, but I digress speaks volumes. Throw the book at, I build cliches. No pronoun alone yells louder than wind between. A dress comes out fighting from his corner. One. Zoom, metastasize Skype. No greater than or equal heart limited immunity. Shot in the face of the crowd. Voting with our logins for the right not to be seen or heard. <laughs> Face mats in lieu. We, the first recognition software. Ambient house hype. Beats to build a better Babel. Pyramid scheme 2.0. A-frame ziggurats collapse beneath the weight of type. Left and right speakers, mono stereo. Thanks. Keep it going, Tyrone Williams. As Rodrigo said, Splice uh, did indeed uh, revolve around the metaphor of lit wire and electricity and coming together and making that light appear. But uh, not just the poets, we see the poets tonight splicing together, that's our main metaphor, out of town poet, local poet coming together. Indeed, both of them were grappling with the fact that there's Adidas on the Coliseum floor. <laughs> but it's also a lot bigger than that. And you know, we at Splice and other systems throughout New Orleans with poetry want to give the love back to this insanely packed house. And we thank you because that metaphor carries through is essentially just a gathering. And there's so many gatherings of poetry here in this city you can move to a liminal space. You will come together to bring the shock to the rubber flower that squirts out its water. There's poets on poets on poets every Wednesday at Cafe Istanbul. There's so many that I haven't mentioned. And so, again, we just give it back to you. The second to last, I believe, Bill can correct me, word before St. Augustine died was your will be done. I think he meant y'all. <laughs> and then the last thing he said was something like, come on to me, Jesus, which is almost like another language. I don't understand it. So anyway, as always, thank you. Y'all are the best. Have a great night. Tip your bartender.